hello everyone hello i hope you all can hear me so hello everyone uh, uh, good morning afternoon evening for the people who are joining from all over the world welcome to our session on how can applying the llf principles help to resolve conflict happening uh, we are today as opening as the first session at the CBA, uh, 16 CBA conference, which is, uh, and our session is organized by Practical Action, ECAD, uh, CNRS, CCJB with support from CGRF. Uh, so I'm Tasfia Tasnim, currently working as a coordinator for the Nature Based Solutions Program at the International Center for Climate Change and Development, and we'll be moderating this session jointly with our colleague Chris joining from Practical Action. Uh, just to avoid any technical difficulties, it will be great if participants can read through the uh, housekeeping for the Zoom meeting. Uh, uh, and it is very great if participants can keep their microphone muted while they are not speaking and if they want to come up uh, with like sharing thoughts, anything in the open discussion, please raise your uh, use the raise hand option button. Um, my colleague Afsara will also put a form link to chat requesting for, for some general information so that we can have your details to do some follow up, follow -up activities later. So I'm requesting my colleague Afsara to put that chat on. Uh, I hope you all can hear me. Uh, sorry for some technical difficulties. Uh, so now I would like to invite my colleague, Chris Henderson, Head of Agriculture from Practical Action. Chris leads the Practical Action's global cadre of agriculturists who work in various ways to upscale the use of regenerative agriculture. So it is a driver uh, of inclusive and sustainable rural development. He has also played an active role in supporting the CBA community of practice in recent years. Uh, so my colleague Chris will uh, 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 share his reflection to set the tone for today's session and what we want to achieve. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Tasfia. Uh, what a super introduction. Um, can you hear me? It says unmute myself, but can you hear me? Yes, we um, can hear you. All right. Thank you, Tasfi, for that great introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, this is going to be a really interesting session. Um, what do we want to achieve? Um, so many organizations that uh, we've been working with, Practical Action included, plus uh, ICAD, plus uh, the Center for Natural Resource Studies in Bangladesh, many, many others have been working for years and in some cases decades um, on building the capacity of communities to adapt to climate change. And in many cases, this uh, work has um, been addressing conflict over natural resources, which is caused by um, cl the impacts of climate change. Um, so for most of these organizations, these locally led adaptation principles are welcomed and have been very helpful. Um, in fact, if the truth be told, these principles were derived from the experience of practitioners. And uh, we've been involved in the debate of where the principles come from. So in this session, what are we wanting to achieve? Um, the principles have come in behind the experience. The experience is ongoing. Organizations are going to continue working in the field uh, with communities. But the question is, uh, can we explore how these principles have been useful? What are the strengths and weaknesses of the principles? Um, and can we look at how we as practitioners might be able to use them more, especially in situations where there's conflict over natural resources, which is exacerbated by climate change. And maybe we'll have some tips for people going forward on how to use the principles or maybe on changing the principles themselves. So um, let's have the next slide. What do we want from you? Well, what, what does success look like? Success would look like really active participation in breakout groups and some nuggets of uh, experience and wisdom that we can feed. Um, we can feed outwards and upwards on the use of the principles. Um, so CBA 
let, let's remember what CBA is. CBA is um, a place where practitioners have principally been sharing learning. And it's about building that capacity amongst the community of practitioners who are supporting and working with communities. But there is, of course, a vertical link to try and get the enabling environment we want, the finance we want, the investment we want. So whilst we will share a couple of examples now, one example from Sudan, one example from Bangladesh, to stimulate thinking, and they, they, are, they are hopefully examples you will learn from and you'll, and you'll enjoy hearing about. Success is when you participate actively in the groups, and then we have this joint reflection, and then we share that, and then we take um, learning away from that. And lastly, please don't hesitate to ask critical questions because that's how we improve. We can improve not only from success, but we can improve also, improve also from challenges and failure. So back to you, Tasfia. I hope that sets the objectives of this session for you. Thank you so much, Chris, for, for um, letting us know what do you want to achieve and, and, and um, uh, share the main objective of, of today's session. So now I would like to invite, uh, as Chris already mentioned, that we will be uh, hearing from two examples from uh, Sudan and Bangladesh. So first we'll start with the example from Sudan. So this next presentation was meant to be given by Awadala. Um, uh, who is the project manager of practical actions, work on integrated water resources management in El Fasher, North Darfur in Sudan. Unfortunately, Adala is unwell and unable to join us today. So Demit uh, has offered to deliver the presentation on his behalf. She is uh, the climate and resilience officer for practical action and has been researching on environmental and climate justice topics in the practical actions work on mainstreaming climate change adaptation across all organizations, uh, across the practical actions work too. So Demit, over to you for, for sharing uh, the presentation on behalf of Awadala. Thank you, Tasfia. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about practical actions work in Sudan, as Tasfia mentioned. Uh, so practical action has been working in North Darfur since 2013. And we've been implementing projects there uh, that use an integrated water resources management approach since then. The aim of our work in this region is to support communities who have been displaced by war and who are living in a context where natural resources are scarce and they become more scarce as a result of climate change and where competition for these resources, particularly water, uh, creates conflict between groups with different needs based on their livelihoods as farmers and pastoralists. So we do this by facilitating and coordinating natural resource management structures across the watershed. We provide training on resilient agriculture practices and we deliver conflict resolution workshops. So the image you're seeing here uh, is a community building the spillway of an earth dam it's a key structure for managing water in the landscape. Next slide, please. So these are the two questions I want you to reflect on during this presentation. The IWRM work we're doing predates the locally led adaptation principles. It wasn't designed with these in mind. But many of these principles are fundamental to the success of this project. I will reflect more on this throughout the presentation with examples of how local stakeholders have led aspects of our projects and how we have invested heavily in the creation, the facilitation, and the support of community-based and local organizations and decision-making structures. Next, please. So local leadership is fundamental to the success of IWRM projects. The idea of IWRM is that everyone who depends on a water source for their daily life to feed themselves and to make a living should have a say in how that resource is managed. So there are many difficult decisions that need making. For example, which land should be reserved for grazing? 
how should herds be moved? Which routes, which water points? Where can dams and other water harvesting structures be built? Where to locate and how to build water points? As these decisions are made, a number of considerations must be taken into account. For example, there needs to be consideration of both upstream and downstream use of water and land. There needs to be agreement between groups with different needs, and there needs to be ways to deal with change. For example, what happens in a year where the lack of rain means there's nothing for the cattle to eat? Next, please. So I mentioned roots, these animal roots, they have existed for a long time. But because of conflict, these roots were blocked. And because of climate change, people expanded farming land to encroach on roots. If migratory roots were blocked, then pastoralists went through farmland. So in this project, we, bought, we brought the native administration, which is the local leaders, the pastoralists, and the farmers to agree where migratory routes should be restored and have them agree to adhere to these routes. So this is an example of how devolving decision-making and making sure that relevant stakeholders are involved in that decision-making can reduce conflict. So this post you see marks a route that pastoralists can use to move their livestock between uh, different parts of the watershed. It's important that everyone living and working in the area agree with and are aware of where these routes are. Otherwise, conflict can ensue if a cattle herder's animals eat or trample uh, a farmer's crops. So practical action played a role in convening all affected groups uh, to restore such routes which had been lost during the war. Next, please. So the challenge with devolving decision-making to the local level is particularly striking in North Darfur, where many traditional systems for governance have been eroded over years of war and conflict. This makes equitable and coordinated management of water resources very difficult. And this is why much of practical actions work is focused on developing institutions and decision-making structures that are inclusive of different groups and different needs. Next, please. So our long experience of supporting communities in North Darfur has shown that these communities need technical support, services, resources, support in organizing themselves to manage the land and water, and they also need the building of their organizations and confidence to make decisions. So long-term thinking is key to supporting the capabilities of local institutions. This requires a strong relationship with and trust from people in the communities and stakeholders. There are, these stakeholders are actively working in the area, including the government. So trust needs to be built with all of these parties. We've found that service delivery is an important tool to develop these relationships and the trust. Involving community members in activities with observable positive outcomes early on. For example, by creating new or improved water points because this creates buy-in from the communities. Next, please. So we facilitate a broad range of workshops and training opportunities for farmers and agricultural extension workers to build their capability for sustainable and productive agriculture. In this, we also focus on climate resilient agri agricultural approaches. For example, we use farmer field schools to demonstrate resilient and productive agricultural practices like agroforestry, crop diversification, and the use of organic fertilizers. We also work with local people to implement surface water harvesting practices for optimal multi-usage of water, including dams, crescent terraces, and water points. So this also includes training community members on how to manage and sustain these. 
And finally, we're training community members in natural resource management practices for environmental resilience and livelihoods through activities such as um, soil conservation, greening pasture lands, and community forests. And that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Demit, for this powerful presentation. Uh, now, uh, we would like to go over to Dr. Muklasa Rahman, who is the Executive Director uh, for, of Center for Natural Resources Studies. Uh, Dr. Muklasar is an environmentalist and community-based natural resource management specialist, and his working domains are on the issues related to natural resources governance, restoration uh, of degraded ecosystem through NBS, climate change adaptation, TRR, and livelihoods. Uh, Dr. Mukles, over to you for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Tashpia. Um, our story is from uh, kind of uh, from the coastal area of Bangladesh where people have been suffering from um, cyclones, storm surges, salinity, uh, erosion, water logging, and also drought. This year we have a very drier monsoon. Um, it is, uh, next slide please. Yeah, um, uh, the place uh, we are talking about is very close to Sundarbans uh, mangrove forest. Uh, and uh, Bangladesh is, you know, uh, just giving you a little bit on Bangladesh, is located in South Asia. It's a small country, but with huge population. And it is the seven most vulnerable countries to climate change impacts as per the IPCC rating. Um, the place we are talking about, you can see the villages, three villages within a yellow circle, um, where the people suffer from scarcity of freshwater, particularly and lack of quality seeds and organic manures. Water logging is also a big problem because the drainage canals are choked up or leased out, converted, um, silted up, this and that. And the area suffers from high salinity in the dry season, the soil and water salinity. And so the people can grow only, uh, only monsoon rice uh, because due to monsoon rains, the salinity goes down. So they can harvest only one crop a year. Next slide, please. Yeah, just like to show you uh, some photos uh, on the left side. The canals are leased out by the government to uh, one or two people, and they converted the canals into crab fattening ponds, shrimp ponds, aquaculture ponds, and also uh, some of them made houses. And in some places, it is labeled, filled up and labeled, and using for crop farming. And the right side, you can see uh, the upper one uh, shows the monsoon rice, but uh, the photo below is the dry season scenario, the lands remaining fallow. Next one. Um, actually, the basic problem here is uh, access to fresh water in the dry season. Um, the land is fertile if they can get the uh, water uh, particularly in the rainwater stored in the canal, they can uh, do a lot in the farming system improvement. Um, so what we did with the communities, we uh, had participatory planning and problem census and planning workshops involving male, men, female, and uh, women, uh, male, female, and youth. And we supported um, from the project, which is funded by the uh, CJRF, we call the project as uh, governance for climate resilience. Uh, we excavated four canals uh, to ensure water for the communities to use in the dry season for farming and also capture fishing. Uh, also uh, renovated three ponds and filters to address the drug drinking water scarcity. And a major thrust was given on the climate smart farming systems where the men, women and youth were engaged and also excavated 11 uh, ponds at the household level. Idea is to build the resilience at the household level. Apart from these physical interventions, we conducted uh, capacity building training on uh, adaptive farming systems, as well as advocacy, social auditing, and water policy issues. 
we supported communities to lodge court cases to get the canals free from the leaseholders and we also provided uh, legal support and uh, we actually made alleys all the stakeholders in the area were uh, organized to create pressures on leaseholders and also uh, informing and influencing the local authorities to uh, get the uh, canals free from the leasing system and put it under the community use. And also we have the awareness and dissemination program. Next one, please. Yeah, as I said that, you know, we, uh, this is the farming systems in the in the dry season. Uh, before the project, the lands remain fallow. But now, because of the canal rehabilitation and the storing of the rainwater, um, people can grow varieties of uh, crops. And most of these are cash crops. So, I mean, uh, they can get uh, the cash cash at their home, at their at their hand. And also, we demonstrated three rice crops in a year. And the varieties that we have given are improved and uh, salinity tolerant, some are short durations, um, some are stress tolerant, like, you know, inundation tolerant, these sort of varieties we collected from the Bangladesh Rice Research Institute and Agriculture Research Institute and made a linkage of the communities with them. Next one, please. Yeah, I mean, that's the farming part that people can grow a wide array of uh, crops in the winter. And all these are additional because it was these sort of crops were not there before the project. And the canal, when it is restored from the leaseholders, then uh, the local people, they, they took it over and start fishing. And almost every day, uh, some of them are doing fishing for their household consumption. Sometimes they also sell a part of, part of their catch. So it is a kind of uh, the fishing and also the farming. We facilitated uh, along with the communities and local stakeholders um, to build their resilience. Next one. Uh, and this is the, uh, the pond stuff that we uh, excavated 11 ponds uh, at 11 households uh so that they can use the pond for, it is kind of supporting them to adopt integrated fish vegetable fruit rice farming systems so that they're busy uh, almost year round and it is very close to their homestead so the men and women they uh, they jointly uh, take part in the in the production management and get wide varieties of uh, outputs from this farm like the fruits uh, vegetables organic manure uh, wild vegetables, fish, uh, fodder, etc. Next one. And so uh, the scenario, the farming system scenario in the in the uh, the project area is quite different now. Uh, before the project, it was the winter and summer. The lands uh, mostly remained fallow. They could only harvest monsoon rice, but uh, during the project period and hopefully, you know, beyond the project period, uh, they would be able to grow crops uh, in all the season, three three seasons of the year, and could get the diversity of food system. In the adaptation climate smart farming systems, we always support the crop diversification uh, because some of the crops are very sensitive to climate stimuli, but some of the crops are resistant. So if they have varieties of crops, then they can uh, they can gain from this farming system, diverse farming systems. Yes, next. Yeah, but at one point of time, when we excavated the canal for storing water for the community use uh, in 2018 and 2019 January, we got to know that uh, some vested groups they they list out this canal to other parties and they started putting control and not really allowing people to come etc cetera, etc cetera. and then with the advocacy groups we started a kind of uh, all community campaigns and uh, communicated with the local administration and finally local administration agreed to support and they came to the site with police and uh, land commissioner and they evicted the leaseholders and the communities again took it up so still 
uh, till now the the canal is under the community use and this actually uh, helped uh, communities gaining uh, kind of benefits that they are connected to police and administration and advocacy groups and uh, leaseholders uh, became scared that well it is not very easy to uh, do this sort of illegal bits uh, so that negative uh, event uh, had some positive impacts yeah next one this is also a conflict i mean long lasting conflict in the area between the leaseholders and farmers so uh, during the project period of four years we had to resolve many conflicts related to accessing water uh, water use and farming systems the next one please yeah, we analyzed our uh, results and uh, found that uh, it addresses at least eight SDGs at varying extent. And this also uh, qualifies for nature-based solutions because we restored the wetland ecosystems. Uh, that actually helped communities to diversify their crops and gain lots of benefits. Uh, and it also has, you know, kind of uh, the four types of ecosystem services like provisioning, regulatory, supporting, and cultural. So some students doing master's thesis and one student from ICAT also doing PhD thesis there. And another student is coming from Manitoba University, Canada to uh, do uh, her PhD research. So yeah, I think it's a, I often call it a adaptation lab uh, at the field level. Next one. Yeah, I mean, uh, some approaches and challenges. We actually uh, targeted the whole society of that particular village, I mean, uh, two, three villages, uh, because climate change cross cuts everyone. And uh, restoring canal, freeing from the leaseholders, it needs, you know, societal approach, a collective approach. So, uh, but, you know, Building consensus among stakeholders is challenging because many has you know diverse and colliding interests and uh, influences. And effective participation is also kind of long-term stuff like you know the building community's capacity to influence local decisions uh, with the government stakeholders is is also challenging, taking a long time. And uh, we have adopted the approach we call it three C: consciousness, capacity, and collective action. Uh, this also need a kind of long-term thing and, accom and accompaniment support. Um, we involved uh, the women, youth, and also elderly people uh, in this farming planning and also the farming systems and advocacy campaigns. Uh, but we had to be very strategic in navigating through this, you know, uh, I mean, through the local culture taboos and power hierarchies. But uh, it is doable, of course, and then we did it. And uh, there are um, requests from adjacent areas to do this sort of, you know, uh, water-based uh, uh, farming systems or adaptation activities. Um, but however, we uh, for that we need some additional resources and logistics. Uh, next one. Yeah, this is the last slide. I mean, uh, I just like to show you two photos. One in the left one showing that we distributed short duration uh, rice varieties. Uh, you can see the, the yellow rice is like uh, ready to harvest. Uh, but at the same time, you can see the traditionally used varieties. It would take another two weeks. So uh, in areas like climate hotspot, I mean, uh, farmers should adopt short duration varieties to avoid any climate risks. And uh, the women, the girls are also very interested in farming systems. So they are allocated a parts of the canal banks and they did uh, vegetable farming in the area. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mukhla sir, for your amazing presentation. Uh, so now we would like to uh, go to Dr. Haseeb Ifranullah, who is the independent consultant for environment, climate change, and research system, in all, and is also a visiting research fellow at the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. Dr. Haseeb frequently writes, talks, and conducts research on NBS and locally led adaptation to steer conversations on these two concepts and approaches. So, uh, Dr. Haseeb, I have a question for you. 
Uh, so what are your thoughts uh, on the approaches and interventions being taken for these two cases that we just heard from Sudan and Bangladesh? And if you can share your reflection from, as we know, the eight principles uh, for the locally led adaptation. Um, uh, I, I just want to request you to keep your conversation in five minutes because we are a little behind on time. Thank you, Hasib. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashwia. We have heard two fantastic presentations from Sudan and Bangladesh. I'm not going to recapitulate what we have heard. But uh, essentially, they've uh, clearly showed, they have shown that uh, how each and every intervention is linked with one or more uh, principles of LA. But we can, since we're talking about resource and how resource leading into conflict under climate change, we can see that definitely because of climate change, since the resource is getting scarce in terms of number as well as amount as well as quality and uncertain. So we have seen how those uh, application of those principles actually enhance the resources, expand, expanded capacity and skills of the local people to, to uh, adopt uh, the technology which has been transferred through different public interventions, how the governance structure was reformed and how people came together to prioritize their actions to create balance between, I wouldn't say conflicting demands, but you know, demands from different fractions and ensure that proper trade-offs are being taken care of. But most importantly, we often don't see the marginalized communities, they are uh, exerting, they are actually establishing their rights over those scarce uh, resources. But locally led adaptation principles actually help us or help the marginalized communities to fight for their rights over those scarce resources. And we are not talking about only now, but here to come. Uh, my last point is I will be sharing three particular aspects that I have been thinking of as we I am following the locally led adaptive principles. The first one is you will see that different issues are being addressed or taken care of or touched upon by more than one principles. If we talk about finance, it is not only principle, the third principle, but also principle seven, as well as principle eight, which talks about collaboration and investment. If we talk about knowledge and learning, it is not only about uh, principle five, which talks about uh, understanding the climate risk, but also uh, principle six, which talks about uh, how to have program, a flexible program and uh, learn from it. So my first point is we need to understand those overlaps and communicate it properly. Communication is my first point. The second one is we often see each principle uh, you know, individually, like these are silos. But the example from Bangladesh, we have seen that, no, you have, to, you have to connect. One intervention can touch upon more than one principle. So we need to bring all the principles, all the issues together and see things holistically. And using my first uh, 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 thought on communication, Holistically seeing things holistically can help us to communicate it better. The, my final point is what next? We have been uh, promoting, we have had uh, more than 80 or around 80 uh, organizations and the government endorsing the principles. Then what's next? I believe that we need to identify, we need to translate these principles into actionable points. Uh, so that it would be general points, but those need to be contextualized, those broad points, so that we can really make these principles actionable and we can learn from it rather than taking it as a kind of uh, something big, something, something philosophical. That's all from me. Thank you, everybody, for listening to me. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Haseed, for, for uh, sharing your reflection and and... Uh, commenting on these two cases. Um, I hope it opens up a new window for discussion when we go for the open uh, uh, open discussion later our breakout group activity. So now it's time for breakout group activity where we will spend 20 minutes together. Um, uh, and I think there will be four breakout group uh, uh, that my colleague um, Anna will, will be setting up. 
but before that let me uh, try to explain the what we would like to do in this breakout group so we have two questions for you uh, these questions are showing up in the screen if you can see do you agree that the implementing uh, the locally led adaptation principles can reduce conflicts uh, fueled by climate change and the second question is, do you have any suggestions on how to improve the use of uh, locally led adaptation um, uh, uh, principles or the principles themselves? So we have a very simple table, uh, which we have put together in the, uh, break in, the, in the group slides. And we have four breakout group facilitator who will be helping the over overall room to coordinate this discussion. And we would like to hear one strong message for each of the questions. So we would like to hear two uh, messages for each of the uh, questions from your room. Uh, it will be great if one of the participants from the room can volunteer uh, to, share, to share those reflection when we are come up uh, after 20 minutes. So I just like to request um, Chris, uh, Shahnawaz and Tamanna to be very strict on the time, we will get back from the room sharp at 3 p.m. Dhaka time, which is 9, 10 a.m. Uh, UK time BST at this moment. Uh, so Anna, are you are you good to set up the uh, breakout group? And the facilitators, please uh, turn on the recording again when you are in the breakout group. Yeah, the rooms are ready and I will open them now. If you have any problems, just uh, message in the chat. Yes, just message.
Hi, everyone. Uh, I, I hope you all have a great discussion. Uh, so now we would like to hear from uh, all the summary from all the group activities. Uh, uh, as uh, we need to have some time in the later part and also leave some time if any audience have like any final thoughts to share. Let's keep two to 2.5 minutes uh, for reporting back from each of the group. I hope that sounds okay. So the first group was Chris, uh, your group. So did you get any volunteer from your group to present? Hi, Pash. Who I will present on behalf of our group. Um, so yeah, yeah, during the discussion, um, thank you. So one of the key points that we came up is that, you know, when there is conflict affected area, since there is a very low trust between communities, so um, so we thought that for um, LLA could, you know, be of more of like a complementary approach, which would help for conflict resolution um, and would really help in the long term of building trust. We also thought that, you know, even though LLA is existing and a lot of organizations are still endorsing the principles, but we need indicators that will help, um, that will really help us to do the evaluation and measure the impact of using the principles. Other than that, um, we thought that the principles are a guiding tool, but it is more of a framework that really highlights the best practice and is a standard to follow. And the rest you can see in the screen, but we thought these were a few of the few of the points that we wanted to highlight. But Chris, do add if anything you want to highlight uh, during the breakout room. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, one, yeah. just one point I wanted to add, which Please. was really interesting, is people in communities are very aware that actions have to be inclusive. And I, it, somebody said it, that is actually the problem is getting that message to people who are operating at higher levels. And that's where the principles may be particularly helpful. Great, great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, now, going for the breakout group two, where I facilitated, uh, Anna, can you please go? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we, had a, we had a volunteer from our group, uh, but uh, she was struggling with her um, uh, microphone. So Cho Cho, are you here with us? Uh, if she's not here, then probably I can report back. But Cho Cho, I can see you in the list. Can you share one point from our session? Okay, yeah, uh, Chocha, I got your um, message. Okay, probably she is struggling. So probably I can report back from our group. Uh, so we had a very, very, very uh, interesting discussion and conversation and like to highlight two points from our group. Uh, where we actually talk about that, uh, where uh, we had a discussion about that LLA principles can possibly not be able to reduce conflict in the way, but it can identify the root causes uh, 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 for, the, for, uh, for what causes uh, the conflict happening. For example, the power imbalance or the power issues uh, for, uh, um, uh, on the local versus elite. So this is very one important point that we have discussed. Uh, you, you all may see other important points, but I'm not going over those now. And moving on to the second question that we have that how we can improve the use of principles. So here, uh, I would actually like to highlight two points because those two were very interesting from our group. Uh, one is that uh, to make the local communities or the people um, uh, like understanding on the issues, there has to be targeted capacity building related training. But we also discussed that the, this has to be like, the training has to be done from both uh, national to local level or for both top to bottom level. And as well as to, to, to see that if the principles are being, principles cannot be, used basically so there has there has to be some guidelines or the criteria or indicators for the principles to be measured uh, where we can track 
uh, our progress, like what we're doing good or bad. And like IUCN has adopted criterion for eight criteria for NBS with uh, like significant or uh, like with particular indicators. So these are the two points that I'd like to hear uh, share from our question too. Um, I hope I'm on time. Now going back for uh, going back to group breakout group three. Uh, so Shanawas, did you have any volunteer from your group or would you like to report back? Yes, we have volunteers and we really have a good um, lineup in the group. We had a really great discussion. So I'm inviting um, them to share our discussion. Yes, thanks, uh, Shanawas. Yeah, we had a really good discussion. So in terms of the, um, the first question, <clears throat> How can, um, if the principles of LLA can reduce conflict? So uh, what was said in our group was that it can reduce conflict, yes, but um, there are certain things that are also, that can only be done by the central government. So that's another thing to keep in mind and not everything can be achieved by uh, simply applying LLA principles. Another issue was that understanding risk and vulnerability. Uh, this is critical. So. Um, and this is similar to the, the point raised in group two, actually. So we also said that looking at the vulner vulnerabilities behind the conflict. Um, and uh, LLA allows us to understand uh, the reasons behind the conflict so that we can address the root of the problem and instead of just providing temporary remedies for it. So that's one overlap. Uh, another one was engaging local governments, uh, influencing local uh, governments' development plans and I'm monitoring the delivery of those plans. Uh, another one was around limitations of LLA uh, because communities are not um, homogeneous. They are, they are not cohesive. So conflict sensitivity should be part of risk analysis and uh, always keeping in mind the risk of doing harm um, while engaging the groups uh, in trying to apply these principles uh, should be kept in mind. Uh, another point was the role of uh, LLA in uh, recognizing and understanding indigenous and local knowledge and respecting uh, these uh, forms of knowledge and making sure they are integrated into, into plans. Uh, and the final one was recognizing the links between uh, local conflict and, and its broader national dimensions, uh, always keeping in mind uh, the national context as well. Uh, so in the in the section about how to improve the use of the principles, um, again, we talked about understanding the, the broader context, uh, especially conducting political economy and political ecology analyses. Uh, the importance of understanding power structures and uh, the ongoing struggles around power and uh, understanding how we can effectively engage by keeping those in mind and also keeping in mind that not all stakeholders in a country context might have positive interest uh, in applying the principles. Uh, another issue that again overlapped with the second group uh, was um, uh, using measurable indicators as in nature-based solutions. So the possibility of maybe applying these to LLA as well, fi finding uh, indicators that might work in the LLA uh, context. And the final point was, um, again, considering uh, the use of LLA in um, different contexts, such as conflict, as we touched upon uh, in, the, in the presentation, but also uh, migrating communities, communities that are in flux. So um, what are the kind of new knowledges that are being introduced uh, in such communities? Um, and do they remain excluded or do they get included? And also in reverse, um, passing information to these new communities, especially in the context of climate migration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dimit, for uh, sharing interesting thoughts from your group. Now over to Tamanna. Do you have any volunteer from your group? Um, uh, Tasfia, no, uh, we didn't actually get any volunteer. So I'll just briefly uh, present what we got. So it was really, uh, some interesting discussions that we have had. So definitely for the first question, uh, whether they, whether we agree that the uh, principles of LLA uh, are helping to reduce conflict caused by climate change, yes. Uh, and 
most of the participants talked about the devolving decision making principles, which is decision making to the lowest level, which deals with climate change, deals with nature and natural resource management. Uh, we talked about uh, there were discussions on the tragedy of the commons and how to manage the common pool resources, uh, maintaining a balance in the nature. We also talked about what are the ecosystem level and social level uh, harmful coping uh, mechanisms to deal with the climate change induced problems. Um, and there were examples from Sudan and Mali uh, on different resource user group who have different livelihood practices and who need to migrate at different uh, uh, seasons to you know, uh, gain the access to different resources. And there are definitely scarcity of resources, uh, which is further provoked by the climate change induced impacts. So definitely the solutions and what the interesting works that uh, organizations like uh, Friendship, organizations like Islamic Relief are uh, doing. We also have seen the presentation from uh, Sudan. So uh, like definitely the LLA principles of uh, uh, working in a whole of society approach, coming up with a comprehensive approach and taking the decisions to the community level is definitely helping in uh, reducing conflicts created by climate change uh, to a certain extent. But definitely there are gaps which were identified. Uh, so definitely it, the uh, like principles are not standalone solutions. And we also talked about uh, the work of Eleanor Ostrom, where she is dealing with how community members are taking practical arrangements to solve the climate change problems. And this could be a very interesting case to take upon by different development practitioners to deal with the uh, community level uh, de devolving decision making process. So for example, LLA principle talk about decision making should be be devolved at the community level, but definitely there are certain power structures and groups like uh, like landlords or big corporations and these and that. So how they are influencing certain decision making and how it should not be biased and how it should be inclusive. So that needs to be uh, facilitated and that should be taken into consideration in incorporating the LLA principles. And uh, we also got some interesting examples, for example, in Mali, in conflict resolution uh, mechanism, they thought about uh, implying the religious framework and sensitizing community. So what are the uh, religious framework is implying and how it can sensitize the community to manage their common pool resources in, a, in an efficient manner. So yeah, that's from my group. And I really like to thank uh, all the participants for the interesting discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tamana. That's a very rich discussion, mm -hmm. I'd say. And yeah, as you also mentioned, I'd like to thank all the participants who have like cooperated with us so efficiently to make this uh, happening on time. So now, Chris, uh, I would like to uh, hand it over to you for the final reflection session and concluding remarks. Chris? So, yeah, firstly, I am actually very impressed with the richness of the discussion that the breakout groups had. I confess uh, we had a few technology problems with me struggling to find the uh, facilitator notes in, my, in our group, but I think we, 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 we still came up with some great insights. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me is that um, the battle isn't over when a project is designed using the principles. And even join the project. One of the things that uh, is a sort of a reflection from myself was when Moklesha was talking about the fact that during the life of the project itself, some of the leaseholders uh, took regained control of the canals, and it was necessary to bring in the police and then go to court and revert the action once again. And it it, uh, it makes us realise that what we're working here is a a, a world that's constantly in in flux. So we need to constantly show that this uh, grassroots development of power uh, to, to influence action, it needs constant work. So one of the things that uh, we see from the breakout groups is that nearly all of them talked about measuring, ways of evidencing and measuring the value of using the principles. You know, having having indicators in a monitoring system so you can demonstrate the impact of those principles to the people who need to use them constantly. 
Um, what we're going to do, though, is use this uh, few minutes to actually hear back from Hasib uh, and then and then the other two presenters to see after the breakout groups what they feel uh, they've learned from uh, others about their case. Uh, but Hasib first, before I go to uh, uh, Moklashur and then Demet, Hasib, would you like to? Um, this is reflecting back on what you've heard from the groups and then the insights you gave from the case studies. So we'll give you three minutes for that and, and, and hear from you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yes, uh, I fully agree with you uh, how rich the discussion was in the break. And uh, uh, thank you very much uh, to Practical Action and other uh, partners for organizing this because it, it gave the platform to those who actually didn't get a chance to share their experience, you know, through presentation. But one thing found I found quite interesting that the commonalities, isn't it? Uh, the challenges, uh, the opportunities, and the positiveness that we have heard from different groups. That, but they also talked about the kind of, I would say, limitations because these principles had been prepared to guide as a guiding principle. The GCA, when it was the commission, not the center, definitely WRI, IIED, they came up with this fantastic uh, guiding principle to make, uh, make us understand. But uh, in Bangladesh, especially as we hear, as we talk with different civil society organizations, uh, government and uh, NGOs, they often challenge us not by us, I mean those who are actually proposing or promoting LLA principles. Why so many different terminologies, so many different uh, guiding principles? We used to talk about CBA. I'm sure we are attending CBA conference and we're very much aware of over the last 15 years, if not 20 years, we have been talking about CBA, community-based adaptation. Now we are talking about LLA, why? I think one thing came up quite as strongly as uh, Dr. Salimun Hawk actually told in one of the meetings. In fact, in Bangladesh, we launched a platform uh, under the leadership of uh, ICAT, International Center for Climate Change and Development, which is a national platform on LLA. And I think he actually pointed out a fantastic point. I, I can't help myself but sharing that the core the core uh, value of LLA principle, whether you are talking about reducing conflict or addressing conflict or making a structural change or not, importance of knowledge, evaluation, indicators. The most important thing is leadership because we're talking about locally led, not only uh, people's participation or not, we're talking about the leadership. That's the very important point, Dr. Salimul Hawk actually mentioned Tasia was there the other day last week. And I think that make that changes everything. Is it just the leadership of a particular organization which is coordinating? Is it the leadership of uh, individuals or is it the leadership of some organization which we haven't thought of that they could be the leader? So uh, I think uh, we have heard some fantastic cases from two countries. We have heard some reflection from different parts of the world, colleagues who are interested in, or may I call them LLA enthusiasts, otherwise they wouldn't be participating here. But I'm very optimistic uh, despite the challenges because the, uh, the main focus of today is uh, whether LLA can reduce conflict over natural resources under changing climate. But I think we, we need to have this conversation more and, uh, uh, and take some of the, I'm sure there will be a plenary session where we can actually reflect uh, or share whatever we have discussed here over the last one and a half hour or so. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. That's all. Thank, you. Thank you, Asib. I mean, one of the things perhaps that uh, your point that you made there about leadership takes on board is that th some of these things are very thorny, like they're really... Uh, inbuilt um, problems that are going to need boldness as well as good analysis. Um, I think the uh, uh, there was a point made by breakout group three 
about understanding the political economy. Uh, and, and I think there is, uh, we probably don't talk enough about that, uh, understanding the deep rooted uh, political and economic reasons why I think there are tensions. And if they're not addressed, and that needs good leadership, um, then yes, I, I think it, 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 it's uh, difficult to make progress. Can I hear from Mokleshaw? Uh, Mok give you a couple of minutes, Mokleshaw, for your final reflections. Um, you've heard from others, as well as, of course, you know your case well. Are there any final reflections in one or two minutes you would like to make? Yeah. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Grace. Um, the way actually we see the local level uh, adaptation activities, uh, we first think of consensus building. Because conflicts, the big conflicts or micro or small conflicts is almost everywhere, both in uh, rural and urban settings. For example, in our case, the con there are conflicts between farmers and the aquacultures, culturists, the rice farmers and the shrimp farmers, uh, the fishers and the uh, forest department, uh, conflicts about livestock rearing in the dry season. So conflicts on all sorts of, almost every sectors or subsectors of land water-based production systems. And we need to intervene or organize or sensitize informing communities to, I think it is important to focus on not adaptation, but you know, building adaptive capacity. Because the climate change speed is always uncertain. Uh, over the last 50 years, people say we didn't have this sort of uh, drier monsoon that we have this year in Bangladesh. But at the same time, in the northeastern part of Bangladesh had two flood waves and that was devastating and unprecedented. And still the people are fighting to cope with, with the loss they, they face due to uh, double flooding. So there are lots of uncertainties. So we need to build consensus, what to do, how to navigate, and then capacity, I mean, the leadership, locally, led, locally uh, we need to build the leaderships and definitely with the technical capacities to plan their activities. For example, and also it is very important um, uh, uh, that what people talk about the adaptation interventions. For example, we have given uh, a, a variety of rice that that is inundation tolerant. If the rice remains under water for two weeks, they can grow and give good yields. When I was talking to them, uh, the women, one woman said, it's fine that we get rice even after inundation, but the rice is not tasty and my children didn't like it. And then what did it do? We sold the rice, uh, this variety, and we bought it. So it's a very important piece of information. We said that, well, definitely we have contacts with the Bangladesh Rice Research Institute and we'll pass this information to them. So there are good knowledge there. I mean, we learn a lot of things and communities also learn and there are good bundle of knowledges that we need to harvest. We need to also enrich ourselves in it. So LLA provide that sort of opportunities because we work in a very... Uh, small nested sites with small number of communities. So better we can go deeper uh, vertically rather than we have many sites and big uh, mega projects and then we are lost in the horizon. So I personally uh, like this locally led or CBA or whatever you say, but uh, the conflict management and building capacities and connectivity. The local communities, if they are connected to local government, local administration, police, and uh, the local advocacy groups, uh, even the allies of the member of parliaments is important in the case of Bangladesh because MPs, in this, they are very, they are not very effective in the within the parliament, but more effective in their local area. So what we did, we cannot go there to him, but 
we made partnership with with his allies so that he can pass the information to to the MPs and uh, keep him informed and supporting to our initiatives. So there are lots of issues that we need to we need to handle. LLA is not easy. It's good, but it is not easy. It's very difficult. In, Thank you. Very valid point, Mark the Show. And in fact, what you pointed out is you've been working in this community for a long time, and the political connections, the knowledge, and that understanding is really important. The principles can, I think, it's been pointed out one or two groups. They can be very good for um, uh, um, a highlighting the standards that need to be followed. They're a guide for best practice, but at the end of the day, there are these long-term relationships and this uh, that, that need to be done. I like your point uh, very much about uh, co building consensus and building capacity. You use the term adaptive capacity. That was a phrase that was heavily used a few years back. Maybe we should be talking more about building adaptive capacity. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes, Demet. Can would you, is there a key reflection you'd like to have? And then, Saskia, I see you put your video on, and you've done a super job of facilitating the process throughout. So maybe I'll ask you also for a final reflection. But Demet, a minute, and then Tasfia. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. I'll keep it really short. So um, I really, really enjoyed this session. I think the discussions were extremely rich. So I think that what is very clear here is that we have a wealth of knowledge here uh, in terms of understanding vulnerabilities, building consensus, engaging local national governments, uh, building capacity at the smallest local level. So that's clear. The final thought that I would like to leave us with is, so as practitioners, how do we bring this knowledge base, this wealth of knowledge to the global stage? Um, such as ongoing processes around establishing a global goal on adaptation. So um, LLA is not an official discussion stream at the UNFCCC level, but there is great need for practitioners to bring their knowledge base and their experience to the table at these global level negotiations. Um, we need to bring examples of good practice, which we have uh, an abundance of, uh, and build a case for placing local communities at the heart of uh, adaptation actions across the globe. So how do we make sure that LLA gets recognized and adopted? Uh, because ultimately, if as practitioners, we succeed in bringing that knowledge to, to these uh, global spheres as well, then it can help those communities uh, to get you know, the financial and technical support they need. Um, so that's the final point I would like Good to point, make. Demet. Good point. And we will make sure, I think the writer out of the groups complementing these presentations, I think means that we have got a lot to offer to the CBA community of practice that will be written up in the, the final write-up. So thank you everybody for your contribution. Tasfia, you opened the session. Would you like to close it on our behalf? We've got one minute left and have your final reflection. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, not sure if I'm in a very good position to make a final reflection like because we have heard a lot of uh, very interesting points from all of our speakers um and and as well as moderator chris uh from you on the on the on the final reflection but uh i'd like to just reiterate the point from our group again that uh to to make the lla principles working we need to have a framework or like a guideline with criteria and indicator because otherwise, as we all know that we are still struggling to uh, tracking the adaptation uh, because it's, it's, it's very vast and it's, it's also as well as locally specific and has social, cultural, uh, political, very, very many dimensions. So we need to find ways to measure, track uh, and make progress uh, as, we, as we move forward. I uh, also would like to uh, add uh, another uh, point is that ICAT is uh, currently building a national platform for locally led adaptation. 
to bring uh, up the group, like-minded group together. Um, uh, so probably my colleague uh, Afsara, when we, um, uh, we have, I hope we have uh, got email addresses from all of you uh, that the uh, form link that uh, my colleague Afsara has posted. So uh, uh, from there, probably we would be able to share more information. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, like all of our speakers, Demet, uh, Dr. Mukles, Dr. Hasib, uh, moderator Chris, as well as like the people who have worked from the back uh, background, like Anna, who has provided amazing tech support, my colleague Afsara Bushra taking notes, screenshots, and uh, like uh, colleagues from CNRS, um, uh, CCJB, Practical Action, as well as Taman and Shana's, Shana's who have helped us in the uh, breakout group. So thank you everyone. And finally, we would like to sincerely appreciate the cooperation and support we have received from the CB organizing team, Sam, uh, Aaron, Aaron, and the whole tech team, uh, everyone, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, and I think we had a good discussion and we can hopefully take something forward from here. Thank you so much.